Welcome to episode 66 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. If you're a new listener and you enjoy the show, we would really appreciate it if you give us a five-star rating and review on both Apple and Spotify. And if you're watching us on YouTube and you enjoy the content, it would be a big time if you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. It's over, everybody. The Stanley Cup was officially handed out last night to the Colorado Avalanche after they defeated the Tampa Bay Lightning in six games, and they did it on the road in Tampa. What a season for the Avalanche. They were dominant from day one, really, until the end of the season. They were arguably the best team in the NHL from gate to wire. So an incredible season for the Colorado Avalanche. We are going to get into the cup final, give you our thoughts and opinions on everything we saw in this series. We're going to get into some other topics as well. Maybe some Barry Trotz talk. Could he potentially coach the Leafs in the near future? And then also... We will give you our thoughts on the NHL awards that we saw recently. But before we get into all that, it is time to welcome in my partner in crime, Mr. Michael Lapore. How you doing, man? Doing well, Anthony Bruno. Sad to see the uh, NHL season come to an end as the uh, big hockey fan that I am. But as they say, all good things must come to an end. Episode 66. Bruno, I think this is the first one. I think this is the first one we've had. I don't have a shout out in the history of the Toronto Maple Leafs. No player has ever donned the number 66. Uh, Josh Hosang wore 66 in, with the Islanders. I don't know if you remember, there was that whole kafafa lost whether or not he should be permitted to wear that jersey out of respect or disrespect to Mario Lemieux. But he actually wore 96 with the Marlies. So I assume he would have worn 96 with the Leafs had he been called up. Either way, no player in Leafs history has ever worn 66 maybe in the near future. But in the meantime, Mario Lemieux, what a player. Might as well give him a shout out. Interesting tidbit about Mario Lemieux, Bruno. If you had to guess how many heart trophies Lemieux won, how many would you guess? Ooh, okay, let me guess this real quick. Well, I think Gretzky probably stole like half of the heart trophies that he would have won. Not stole. I mean, they were well-deserved, obviously, yeah. for 99. I would say, hmm, does he have, I would say like two or three. He's got three. Three. Yeah, okay. that's and what I kinda, figured. Just because, and like you and like you said, like those ones, like his career starting in the mid '80s, to, are like you know they're spoken for. Like no one could get their hands on. But you're saying you know Mario Lemieux, the history of Mario Lemieux, what Mario Mario Lemieux, well, uh, Mario Lemieux say it ten times fast. What Mario Lemieux uh, means to the game. You think the number would be like five or six or something? But I guess I mean after that span where Gretzky was winning them every year, he did have his injuries, this and that. But three, I don't know. I think like it's too low of a number for Mario. Maybe maybe like five or six. No, because he's considered like one of the five greatest players of all time. And you would think he has easily like five plus heart trophies. I have a plaque of him right there. That's Mario? Over my shoulder. I know you can't really see it. (laughs) There you go. um, On YouTube right now. But yeah, that's Mario Lemieux right over there. Awesome player. Yeah, I, I would have never, I, I mean, I, I figured, like I said, that Gretzky just won all the hard trophies that he probably would have won in any other season. So, right. That'd be an interesting thing to look up. Like who, who came second to Gretzky the most times or how many would Lemieux have won had Gretzky not existed? Yeah. What an awesome player, man. Incredible. All right. Let's get right into this, this podcast. And this is all about the Colorado Avalanche. Yeah. What an incredible team. Going back to our predictions before the series, you had the Avalanche in seven. Mm -hmm. I had the Lightning in six. Obviously, you win this time. Let's go. I don't win often. I'll take it. (laughs) Well, weren't you perfect in round one minus the Leaf series? Yeah, I was. I had a really, I had a really good record. I went like throughout the whole playoffs during our predictions. I think I went eleven and four. Okay, so pretty, pretty solid. And yeah, I got the Leafs wrong in the first round. And then obviously Colorado and the Stanley Cup final. So that was two of the four picks that I got wrong. Did we both pick the Flames? Probably. I think we both picked Calgary in the back. Yeah, that was probably another one. Sorry, Oilers fans. 
But this, <laughs> this avalanche team, man, we've talked about it. Like, you know, since we started this podcast a couple of years ago, I feel like we've both been saying that Colorado is the best team in the NHL and yeah. it was only a matter of time. And you just felt like this team was just way too talented not to break through. And it was a lot, this series was a lot closer than, than people realize. Like it's hilarious. Cause after the first two games, Lepore, I was getting messages on social media. Like you're a donkey. How could you pick the lightning? You're stupid, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then a lot of those people weren't saying a word when this thing headed to game six and it was a one goal game. And, and really, if you think about it, Tampa was one overtime win away because they lost both overtime games from this being a seven game series. Yeah. Even they win the overtime in game four, you're going back to two, two. That's a totally different series. We're still playing. <laughs> yeah. So such an incredibly close series. There was a couple of blowout games like Colorado had the seven, nothing win and Tampa had the six, two win, but you go down this avalanche roster, Lepore, there's just so much talent from top to bottom. The guys they added at the deadline as well, like Andrew Cogliano, Arturi Lekanen, Josh Manson, like adding those nice periphery pieces. They didn't make that big splash. I remember how you made fun of the Panthers for, for you know, picking up Claude Giroux at the deadline and everyone was losing their minds being like, oh my God, the President's Trophy winners got Claude Giroux. And then yeah. you have Colorado just, you know, casually going about their business, already locked and loaded, add or, adding a couple periphery pieces. And next thing you know, they go 16 and four on their way to a dominant run to the Stanley yeah. Cup. Yeah. It's too good, man. I think, I think the best way to put it is when you look at the Colorado lineup, you know how good they are because, well, for me anyway, when they were passing the cup around, I was getting like reminded of players they have. Like typically, you know, the captain starts with it. Then there's like two, three guys that like, you know, the oldest guys on the team, the vets, the best players, the goalie. But it kept going in Colorado. And I was like, oh yeah, him. Hey, he's had a good long career and like almost like the reminding of like all these guys like they have on their team and of course you're watching and it's not like we completely forget about players but i think people know what i'm trying to say just what a team man and, and i think it'd be tough for anyone to say they weren't the deserved winners it, it was a close series there was the two overtimes but the big thing i noticed throughout the six games and you tell me what you think about this is there were times where uh colorado was absolutely dominant like, I'd like to see the uh, the possession time, the offensive zone possession time over the six games, because it seemed like there were a lot of times throughout this series where Colorado was just in Tampa's end, snapping it around. The Lightning were, were running around like uh, chickens with their heads cut off. And even if a scoring chance wasn't created, there was even a lot of times like uncharacteristic of Tampa, like they couldn't get it out. So I just think from watching that, you could really see that Colorado was taking it to Tampa. But hairs man hairs the series again you said the two overtimes there were some weird moments i'll ask you when tampa scored and yesterday and as early as they scored were you shaking a little bit for colorado you think like the nerves were kicking in for them oh, 100%, or 100 percent yeah man. that early too. the crowd like here we go they're gonna blow the doors off and oh it could have been it could have been tampa, interesting way oh 100 dude when tampa scored that first goal i thought it was going seven <laughs> Because the demons are, are creeping in, man. Like, especially considering what's happened to this team the last few years. You go back to last season when they were the Stanley Cup favorites. They're up 2-0 on Vegas. Yeah. And then they lose that first game. Then it's 2-2. And Vegas wins four straight to advance to the final four to play the Montreal Canadiens. In a year that everyone, everyone, it was the same thing last year. Everyone thought Colorado was going to win the cup last season. And they flame out in the second round. And you think, uh-oh, here we go again. The demons are creeping in. Tampa's going to force a game seven without Braden Point with all the injuries they're dealing with. And, and Colorado was dealing with injuries as well. You made a really good point, Lepore, when they were passing the cup around. And you're like, oh, my God, they have this player and that player. I, I remember it really hit me when they passed the cup to Miko Rantanen because okay. he was like the eighth or ninth guy oh God. to hoist the Stanley Cup. And I'm like, oh, my God, Miko Rantanen. He was like their leading scorer among forwards. McCarr led the team in scoring, but ranted it at 25 points. This guy makes nine and a quarter million dollars, and he's like the ninth guy to touch like the Stanley Cup. an afterthought on this team, yeah. Just what a team. so wild. But, but yeah, man, I, I, thought, I thought Colorado was, was getting a little nervous, but kudos to them, man, for, for closing the job on the road when they were down one nothing. 
Yeah. You see what Cooper said? You mentioned the injuries. Cooper made a point to say, he said, had this been the regular season, literally half their lineup would have been out. He said, I'd, I'd have half an AHL lineup. I mean, I don't know. That else kind of irks me, man. Like, not that coaches use it as the excuse, but whenever those lists come out after a season ends of like, oh, all the injuries or when a coach makes a comment like that, I don't want to say I completely hate it because I know it is the reality of the situation. Some teams deal with injuries more than others, but to me, it's part of it. Like the old saying that like nobody's healthy, like everybody has something. Because I'm, I'm just saying if, if I was on the Colorado side, that part of me, it's like, oh, is that an excuse? Like you think a healthy lineup would have beat us? Like we have injuries too, boo-hoo, no one's crying for us and we're not going to cry for you. So I think that's part of it. Staying, staying healthy is part of the reason a team wins a Stanley Cup. So I don't know, it kind of works me the wrong way when a coach or the GM at the end of the season speaks up and starts listing and firing off injuries or talks about the injuries the team's had. I don't know. I don't like it. That's fair because every team's dealing with injuries. Colorado was dealing with a ton of injuries as well. Nazem Kadri set on the ice. Other than the quote of the Stanley Cups were of the Stanley Cup where he said, For all the people who thought I was a liability in the playoffs, you can kiss my ass. I didn't see that actually. How did I not yeah. see that? Oh man, Lavore, how did you miss that last on live night? TV? That was live on television. He was talking to David Amber and Elliot. I must Friedman. have been taking a piss or something. I don't know. I don't know. And miss David that. Amber asked him a question saying like, oh, what do you have to say to all your fans back in London and even Toronto who have been following you throughout your career? And he thanked yeah. all, all the people that have stuck with him since day one. And then he said, for everyone who thought I was a liability in the playoffs, you can kiss my ass. Yeah, well, so that that was awesome. Nas, you, you may, if you're not playing, you're not playing. Sorry, bro. So us Leafs fans can kind of say we love you. Don't get me wrong, we love you, but yeah. that that's also fair. But yeah. the point that I was trying to get at is, besides that incredible quote he gave, he also said that he couldn't even tie his own skates. I heard that yeah. with his hand injury, so he had to get the trainers to tie his skates before every game when he finally returned to the Cup final. He returned in Game Four and scored that overtime winner. But like you said, both teams dealing with injuries, especially at this point in the playoffs, when you make it to the fourth round, guys are hobbled. Even Nachushkin, he apparently was limping into the building. Like I saw Viz before the game where he had one regular shoe on and then he had like a, a sandal on his right foot and he could barely walk, but he ended up playing the clinching game. But that Lightning team, man, I, I listened to that whole John Cooper press conference. I love listening to that guy talk. I, yeah, I just, too. He's just so smart. He's so thoughtful. And let's just take a, take a moment here to, to grasp what this Tampa Bay Lightning team has done over the last eight seasons. So six appearances in the conference finals, four appearances in the Stanley Cup final, and they obviously have two Stanley Cups. What an eight-year run that is, man. Like, Yeah, I, underappreciated. I, it's unbelievable. And to think about how they won the first cup without Stamkos, who played five shifts the entire playoffs, and then almost pulled off the three-peat without Braden Point, their number one centerman. Like, it's just, it's just unbelievable that this team almost had a chance to pull off the three-peat. And... I just have so much respect for that lightning team and everything that they've gone through and the run that they're on. And I don't think this run is going to end anytime soon. I'm not saying they're going to get back to the cup final next year, but this is a damn good team. And we have to sit back and appreciate what that team has accomplished over the last several seasons. Yeah. I think, I think a term that was used sort of in previous hockey eras, uh, with certain, a term that was used with certain teams, like a t teams that find a way to win, no matter what they find a way to win. And I'm, the, the team I always think back to, not an NHL team, but is the 2002 Canadian Olympic team. I just looked at that lineup and whatever, compare talent to any other team in the tournament. You just see those names and you just knew like, this team's going to find a way to win. And I think almost that art has kind of been lost with this new age of young players and you win on speed and skill and tactics I felt that way about Tampa throughout the playoffs. Like no matter what happened, I never counted them out. Every time they got a lead, I'm like, they're going to be able to hold on to this. The whole Vasilevsky thing, the series against Toronto is a perfect example. They doesn't matter how they did it, but they found a way to win. And it, I felt that way throughout the entire Colorado series. I can never count them out. And I guess the, the proper terminology is just DNA. 
like without sounding cheesy here, like they have a D- the DNA of a champion. They have the DNA of a winner and it's in the makeup of the lineup. It's top to bottom. And I'll say it as, as far as organizations go, they're the model franchise, like how they're run, the way the players seem to like take those slight discounts to stay together. Sam coast, man, Sam coast is going to go down as like an all time leader. Maybe don't, maybe we don't feel that way now, but like, look what you just listed off. All those conference finals, the cup finals, the uh, the two cups, crazy, crazy. This guy's going to go down as an all-time great captain. John Cooper, fantastic. Vasilevsky, maybe the best goalie ever. It's just they're the model franchise. They know how to win, and it's inside them. And kind of funny, oh, here's the Leafs fan <laughs> talking about this team that can always find a way to win, and it's in their DNA to never lose. But... I enjoy watching it, man. And I, I enjoy being a neutral throughout these playoffs. And I watched Tampa the whole way through. Just awesome team. And to follow up on your point, I wouldn't count them out next year. Someone made the point, I think it was on the Steve Dangle podcast, that they wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of surgeries this offseason. Like, look at all the runs this team's been on. And if we get that list, I hear I just talked about, like, coaches making excuses. But you get that list of, like, five or seven major surgeries. And maybe they could have a slow start to the next season, like waiting for guys to come back or just guys who aren't hundred percent healthy. And they just kind of chill during the regular season, like get the wild card spot or whatever, find a way to get in the playoffs. But if someone told me right now, they were uh, laying the bet on the Tampa Bay lightning to uh, win the Stanley cup next year, I wouldn't argue with that bet. That's for sure. Yeah. This team is so good. Like if they play the Leafs in the first round of the playoffs again, next season, <laughs> like, are you terrified? Well, Again? I, to the point of the wild card, I mean, I expect the Leafs to come out guns a blazing uh, next year. Because, I mean, I think this was said on that same podcast that you fully expect the Leafs to try to win the division next year. So wouldn't it be cute if Tampa Bay just chills all year and ends up in the wild card spot? Funny though, Bruno, we have some Leafs news coming through the Twitterverse during the podcast. Oh, wow. The, okay. The Toronto Maple Leafs have extended Timothy Lilligren two years. All right, Lilligren. Yeah, Lily, Back. two more years in Toronto. No word on a number yet. I'm sure that'll follow. Okay. Yeah. No, I like that, man. I mean, we've talked about Timothy Lilligren and Rasmus Sandin and their trajectory as young players. And I, I think we we both agree that Sandin has more upside, just as like a more dynamic player. But, you know, we also talked about late in the season how much Lilligren – surprised us with his play this season how well he fit in awesome. you know whether it was playing on the bottom pair with mark giordano whether he had to be moved up the lineup i know he ended up being a healthy scratch at the end of the season and in the playoffs but it's a good player man yeah. very nice player nothing to dislike about the Grin season 100 percent. so i'm i'm glad to see him get extended <laughs> It's time for a quick break for a word from Manscaped. Gentlemen, all men strive for gold in their life, right? Gold medals, gold watches, gold everything. However, there is a certain type of man who goes the extra mile. He walks with the confidence of an eagle and giggles in the face of danger. He's a big, hairless, winning machine. And when he unzips his pants, he sees platinum? That's right, Manscaped would like to introduce to you their best and biggest ultimate hygiene bundle yet, the Platinum Package 4.0. Manscaped is the leader in below-the-waist grooming. Now trust them with the whole thing. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping using the promo code GFP20. Lapore. I mean, it doesn't get any better than the Platinum Package 4.0. Manscaped is killing the game. I love it, man. Guys, Manscaped is not just a shaver for your balls. There's a deodorant. There's a body spray. There's a body wash. There's a shampoo and conditioner. The products go forever. So like Bruno said, go the extra mile. Take care of yourself. Spoil yourself at manscaped.com. GFP20 for 20% off and free shipping the best products if you want to be the best version of yourself you got to pick up the platinum package 4.0 once again get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code gfp20 at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off and free shipping at manscaped.com using the promo code gfp20 it's time you enjoyed the finer things in life and get yourself a platinum package for your platinum package. Let's go. Lapore, you mentioned uh, the Stanley Cup odds. 
for next season. Here we go. <laughs> Let's go over these odds real quick, okay? They're, they're okay. already posted. I mean, depending on what sports book you use, um, I'm sure you can find them right now. But right now, the Colorado Avalanche are the betting favorite to repeat as Stanley Cup champions at four to one. Four to one. Oh my God. They are okay. Four to one to win the 2023 Stanley Cup. That's hilarious. I, I think that's a that's a stay away. I mean, as good as Colorado is, really four yeah, to one. Four to one. That's so like what's McCarr to win the cons might like five to one or six to <laughs> yeah. one or something, like a year away. No, that's oh all my God. That, yeah. that's that's the effect of like they just won. So everyone has a boner for Colorado right now, and bets are gonna come in at four to one, and Vegas is laughing at people taking four yeah. to one. Very good call. But Lapore, guess who is number two on the list behind the Colorado Avalanche? The second favorite to win the Stanley Cup is your Toronto Maple Leafs at seven to one. This team hasn't won a playoff series in 18 years, and they are seven to one to win the 2023 Stanley Cup. You know, Bruno, I think that's absolute horseshit because I think the Leafs should be a slam dunk favorite at number one. But, uh, Number two, it's funny because when you hear number two, you're like, wow, that's too high. Like, that's crazy for them to be the number two ranked team as far as that uh, that list goes. But at the same time, seven to one. Like, I don't think seven to one is crazy. Like, we talked about how at four to one Colorado. I mean, what's a worse someone? Like, at what point would we say Toronto is 100% lay the bet? Like, if someone gave like 10 to one or 12 to one and 115 point team, regardless of who they are, it'd be like 10 times your money, 12 times your money. Yeah. You let's lay the bet. So I think seven to one is quite reasonable. Like what's the, for comparative reasons, like what's the rest of the list? Yeah. Of the, so the I'll top go down the anyway. list real quick. And, and just to say the Leafs, they've essentially been in this range at the start of the last like three seasons between <laughs> like seven and 11 to one, depending yeah, on the book back. you're looking at, they've yeah. been a top, you know, three or four favorite to win the cup. Now, like three years in a row. If they I remember correct, if I remember correctly, the year, the summer they signed Tavares, at least for a brief time, they jumped to they were the best. Yeah, they were the they yeah. were the betting favorite to win the cup the summer they signed JT. Mm. Uh, so to go down the list, then you have Florida at eight to one, the yeah. Lightning at ten to one. Somehow Florida is ahead of Tampa, but okay. <laughs> yeah, that that's another, and, and we're ahead of Tampa for that matter. It's just, but, it's just insane. But anyways. It's insane, but but I mean, it's 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 understandable when you when you think about it from the perspective that you were talking about. But it's still kind of crazy to see the Leafs and Florida ahead of Tampa. To that point, you have, you have teams two, three, and four in the same division. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Mm. And then you go down the list here, Lapora. Some juicier odds as you go down. So then you have Vegas at fourteen to one. That's a good bet. So the books are still very high on Vegas, a healthy Jack Eichel, just a healthy mm-hmm. team in general. Like that, mm-hmm. that's still a really good team. Then you have Calgary at 16 to one Carolina also at 16 to one, the Rangers at 18 to one and Lapore still a team that is not getting any respect despite making it to the conference finals. And I shouldn't say they're not getting any respect but it's the Edmonton Oilers at 20 to one. Yeah. So well, once just again, think how, how many teams in the West are out of them? You said Vegas, Calgary, obviously call it Colorado. So no, they're not getting much respect at all. Yeah. So they, in total across the NHL, they are what? Six, seven, eight. They are ninth. Okay. They are ninth in the betting markets right now. Well, at least in the book that I'm looking at, they're ranked ninth at 20 to one to win the Stanley cup. So you would think Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, who, by the way, ended up leading the playoffs in scoring. Okay, and they yeah. only played three rounds. McDavid finished number one, Dreisaitl number two, McCarr number three. They are 20 to one to win the Stanley Cup next season. Some people might say that's actually a good bet because depending on what they're able to do in the offseason, who knows? That could be a good bet right now, 20 to one. But it's always interesting to look at these at these betting lines. The the morning after the Stanley Cup is handed out. Yeah, Calgary's an interesting one because as the months go by, we find out about if Kachuk gets extended, what happens with Johnny Goudreau. So that could go either way. You could get really good value or really bad value depending on what happens there. And I guess that's the case with a lot of these teams. We don't know what players are going to end up where. So, I mean, now is the time. If you see one where you think the odds are pretty good, lay the bet. The Vegas, I think Vegas at 14-1 to is nice. 
like in solid that, bet. It, I, I'm in, still in I'm a big Jack Eichel fan. I believe in that team. I, I you know a lot of people were shitting on Eichel and and Vegas for missing the playoffs, but don't count that team out. No, that's still a very good hockey team. Now they bring in Bruce Cassidy, who did an excellent job with the Boston Bruins over the last few seasons. So that that team's going to be. I think they're going to be right back in the playoffs, and they're probably going to be in contention to win the Stanley Cup, like we saw for the first what three four years of their existence they've only been i, I think next year is like what their fifth year in the league fifth or sixth five, year is it already franchise it's already five years that's crazy unbelievable man the last couple but, years are all blur with all this covid shit so yeah you're probably right yeah no but you said it with yeah. calgary like you don't know what's going to happen with their core and another interesting thing i saw floating around twitter and people talking about is how both the lightning and the avalanche did not move away from their core Like they stuck with the same guys. They paid their guys. You know, you you think about Tampa Bay, right? Steven Stamkos, Nikita Kucherov, Victor Hedman, Vasilevsky, Braden Point. Mm. You go look at Colorado, McKinnon, Rantanen, um, Landis Cog. I mean, Makar, it's only like his third year in the league. Really the only change they made, Lepore, is when they shipped off Tyson Berry, who was an original member of that Colorado core. And they obviously shipped him to Toronto in the Kadri and Kerfoot deal. Um, but that, if we're going a little further with back, cores, man. if we're going a little further back, the Duchesne deal. Yep. Matt Duchesne as well, who was an OG yeah. member of that core. But this Colorado team, it was only like four or five years ago. They finished dead last in the NHL. Yeah, like 40 Ed, something points. They were like the laughing stock of the league. They were terrible. They had one of the worst seasons in the last like 25 years in the mm. NHL. And now they're Stanley Cup champions and they stuck with a lot of the same guys. They didn't, you know, make any drastic moves and like trade Miko Ranton in. Even, you know, people forget Nathan McKinnon. It's not like he was a superstar from the second he entered the league. Like he had a he had a rough patch there for a while. And that's why he was only signed to a contract for a little over six million dollars. Now he's gonna get the bag on his mm-hmm. next deal. But you know, it's interesting to look at those teams and then you compare them to the Leafs, obviously. And you can make a strong argument that the Leafs really shouldn't do anything at all with the core that they have in place. Yeah, I know. And everyone knows how we feel about that. But in the comments below, tell us how we're wrong and why the Leafs should uh, trade everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I, still, I still see the comments every day, man, that they got to trade someone from the core or else yeah. this team is doomed. Just, just because, right? J- just, just, just for just, the hell of it. Yeah, we got to shake things up. One thing I got to say, and who knows the talking point it'll become over the summer is Kemper. I mean, would you even say he was average throughout this playoff run? He was like average just to below average. Like and they he was like him. acceptable. Like we'll, we'll put it that way. The advanced stats guys are fucking happy right now. Cause how they all point to don't spend on a goalie. Do not spend on a goalie. And a couple of weeks ago we were sitting here and everybody was saying, Shesterkin, Vasilevsky, you need a goalie. You don't. You don't. And you look back, yeah, good goalies win Stanley Cups. But as, you're, as long as your goaltending doesn't lose it for you, you have a chance. So you can put that money elsewhere. And there's also the matter of an average, less expensive goalie can have a good few weeks. People forget that aspect of it too. So I'm, I'd say on the side that feels that way that you shouldn't, drop the bank on a goalie. I mean, there are exceptions to the rule like Shesterkin or Vasilevsky, but I think in most cases, in most situations, teams are dealing with just try to get average goaltending at a decent salary. Something doesn't hurt you too much on the cap and spend that money in other places on guys that are harder to get or hard to get, I should say. That's a great point, Lepore. Looking at their stats, Kemper played 16 games during the playoff run. So he was in net for 10 of the 16 wins posted a 902 save percentage. Below average. 902. And I'll bet you if we look at his goals saved above expected, there's different websites that that have these numbers. Um, looking at money puck, goals saved above expected. Let's let's go scroll down and look where Darcy Kemper finished off here. Oh my goodness. Negative 4.2. Goal te- saved above expected in 16 games in the Stanley Cup playoffs. That's bad. And then if you look at Pavel Francouz, who was in net for six of those 16 wins, his goal saved above expected 0. 0.5. 
and he so finished he with a 906 save percentage. So they essentially got average to below average goaltending and went 16 and four in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Yeah, man. So you not... bring up a great point. The analytics people, they are popping champagne yeah. after this Colorado Avalanche Stanley Cup run. It just goes to show you, you don't need... I mean, it's great if you have Andre Vasilevsky or Igor Shosturkin. That's fantastic if you have one of the best goalies in the league on your team. But you really don't need that elite goalie to win a cup, and Colorado just proved it. If you have an incredible roster that plays fast, if you have a defense core that can move the puck quickly out of the zone, don't spend a lot of time in your own end, you don't need the best goalie in the world to win a championship. You just simply do not. It's, it's a tough one because, I mean, on last week's show, I believe it was when we were talking about is Vasilevsky the GOAT? Or if he wins the cup, will he be the greatest goalie of all time? So I was on the side that he very well may be the best goalie I've ever seen. But this is a tough one, man. If someone asked me right now, Andre Vasilevsky is a UFA. If you're Toronto, what number would you give him? End term. I wouldn't know. It'd be tough because everyone, I mean, you say, oh, 10, like I wouldn't give him like 10 million. I wouldn't dedicate $10 million to goaltending regardless of who's in the net. But then it's like, well, you'd have to give him pretty close to that because he's a UFA and he is who he is. And then there's the term aspect, how whoever is, it scares the shit out of you um, because it's a goalie. So you might, you're going to have to give more on both sides. The, and I mean, term and money than what you really want to get him. But I don't know. Like, I don't even know what number I'd be comfortable with. If I'm being perfectly honest. Well, because right now he makes 9.5 million. Yeah. Like, and I don't he know. He signed to a big contract. Yeah. That was a eight year deal for $76 million. He's, and next year is only the third year of that eight year deal. So he's yeah. under contract for another six years. <laughs> yeah. See, that's part of my, my thinking too is that like if he was a UFA now, like if he was UFA four years ago or when you started to see him, like, like say, I guess like, like in Shesterkin's case where he's kind of peaking now, maybe it'd be a little different, but I'm not saying like I wouldn't sign him or like it's just, it's tough for me. It's tough. No, it, it really is tough because as great as he is, you know, you just watch Colorado win the cup with Darcy Kemper and Pavel Francouz. Yeah. And I'm sure there'd be a team out there that would get ba Vasilevsky like 10 to $11 million. Easy. If he was a Easy. UFA, but I think a lot of the smart teams would stay away from that. I really do. Well, you said what he saw. He's in year. What of the deal? He's so he, this was only the second year of that deal. So next year is the third year of the deal. So he has of four his eight full years, year, seventy-six left. million dollar contract. So he has four full seasons left. No, he's got six full seasons. Oh, left. It, okay. The six. It was a six yeah. years. It was, sorry, it was six. Not a six year deal. It was an eight year deal. Six years left. Okay. Yeah. So then, if the Leafs could sign Vasilevsky today for nine point five million times six, would you do it? Well, you're gonna have to take away someone from the core. But beyond that, no. But, but I'm saying, like, if they would, I do it. Ah, oh, God, I. Man. It's funny, eh? And like, I know people are like, fuck you, of course you I'm would. I'm like 50-50 like, so, on it, man. Exactly. Like, I wouldn't call anyone stupid for doing it, but at the same time, be like, it's not a slam dunk. I'll put it this way, comparatively, that's what Makar makes. Where if it's Makar, I wouldn't even breathe. Yeah, to, I'm, to, I'm to, taking to, the player all deal. day. Yeah, I, I've been so. in this camp for a long time. Like, if you gave me an elite goalie and, a, and an elite forward, and they're both within, you know, let's say one to two to three years of each other, you know, if someone's like significantly older or younger, that that's a different story. But if they're around the same age, I am always taking either the elite forward or the elite defenseman over the elite goalie. It's Yo, as simple as that. I guess this would be the perfect comparison. So we'll call Kemper average. If we can make a trade with Tampa and get Vasilevsky and an average defenseman or make a trade with Colorado and get Makar and an, uh, and Kemper, which one would you do? Oh, yeah, you're taking Makar and Kemper exactly. all day long, and, and it's not and, even close. And I think that like, that's, like, really emphasizes what I'm trying to say here is that it's tough with goalies, man. Just draft one, get him on entry-level deal, and hopefully it plays out of his mind. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, that's a really interesting point, Lepore. Let us know in the comments what you guys think. Like, yeah. would you sign Andre Vasile? If he was a free agent right now, would you give him over $10 million a year? Or would you have... You know, some, uh, would you be stopping to think about that for a second and, and actually understand that maybe you don't need an Andre Vasilevsky after what we just saw the Colorado Avalanche do on their yeah. way to the Stanley Cup? But very, 
Very interesting conversation with the goaltending. Laporte, let's move on now to Barry Trotz. Oh, Barry. Okay, who told the Winnipeg Jets that he was essentially going to take a break this season. He's not going to jump back into coaching. He's going to take the year off. There were rumors, and I don't even want to call them rumors because I believe Elliot Friedman reported this, that Barry Trotz was also looking at potentially joining the Nashville Predators front office. Okay. There was, yeah, I think I heard there that was, there was different um, opportunities he had. You know, obviously there was other teams pursuing him for their head coaching positions as well, but then all those other teams ended up bringing in head coaches. Like you look at the Dallas Stars, they brought in Peter DeBoer, the Flyers signed John Tortorella. So it was almost like Winnipeg was like the last team and Trotz just said, no thanks, I'm going to take the year off. And Laporte, we always have to talk about how this affects the Toronto Maple Leafs. Of course. Okay, because after they lost in the first round of Tampa, people were thinking maybe Kyle Dubas is going to fire Sheldon Keith, mm -hmm. even though they're really good buddies and they've come up through the system together. Because when a guy like Barry Trotz is sitting there, you have to stop and, and think about that because he's one of the best coaches in the league. But do you think this is a situation where Trotz is maybe waiting until next offseason to see if better jobs come along and maybe – just maybe if the Leafs lose in the first round again, or who knows if they miss the playoffs, maybe Barry Trotz is coming in and he's saving the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, we all know that the reason why he didn't commit to Winnipeg because it was because there's even a slight chance he could end up in Toronto, but uh, that's every coach's uh, dream at night uh, or nightmare, <laughs> probably more accurate. It's the biggest nightmare of every coach in the NHL, but is there's a, if there's a chance, I don't know. I mean, the Toronto media is going to spin it. They're going to want there to be buzz for clicks and discussion. But I'll be the first one to say, I don't want it. And I find it ironic. People have short memories, man. Here people are saying, we got to get this guy. Look what he did with Nashville. Look what he did in Washington. Look what he did with the Islanders. Again, short memories. Remember when there was that coach with the big name who we all wanted? And we celebrated like we won a championship when we got him. Babcock, man, look what happened. As far as the expectations, uh, the expectations that were set, it didn't go very well. And I love the saying, I think I've said it on the podcast before, Colin, Colin Cowherd, you don't want Belichick. You want the next Belichick. And we talked about last week how we really like it when uh, teams give a young guy a shot an up and coming guy, a guy who's kind of got a different type of mindset. That's what I want to see. Like, I know I, 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 I want to see Keith succeed. Like, like, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie about that. And I just hope the Leafs aren't in that situation where we're thinking about uh, changing the coach because that, that's just bad altogether. But I, I think I just don't want it to happen because it'll mean the Leafs aren't doing well. But at the same time, even then I'd rather something else and I'll bring it up. And something I feel doesn't get talked about with regard to trots enough is see his last few years. Isn't that kind of weird? Does it not give you some question marks? Like I, I'm the first one to say there's always so much stuff we don't hear about so many things we don't hear about. And, and I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll say it on the podcast. I'll say it on the podcast. So I saw a post on Twitter about a player who is qu a quite good player, not a star in the NHL, but people knew his name and he was a very good player and it was confusing as to why he wasn't getting the opportunities he was getting, right? And I had heard from someone who knows this player well, there was, there was a lot of personal issues with this player with regard to his behavior, and, the, and teams couldn't keep him straight. And he was getting multiple chances, and teams could not keep this guy straight. He was an asshole all around. So there's just things we don't know with regard to these guys, their personalities, their wants, desires, mindsets, all that stuff. With Trotz, and I'm not saying that's the case of Barry Trotz, but I mean, he had, he, had, he had that run in Nashville, so you can't say anything negative about that. It was just time to move on. So here he is in Washington. They win the cup. They win the Stanley Cup. Washington's ownership has deep pockets, and he walks. And I don't know if you remember, even during the playoff run, during the final, they were talking about how he was leaving. It was kind of like, oh, this is it. He's going to win and move on. Why? Why? Kind of confusing. Yeah, that, now that was bizarre. It was bizarre. And now this thing with the Islanders, again, why? I mean, they're not just like, like Lou Lamorell is not just like this big idiot and he doesn't know how to like measure success. Like, let's give these guys some credit here. 
Because as far as, again, the expectations go for the Islanders last few years, they did a great job. Two conference finals. Two conference finals. And then this year, they got smashed by COVID. Like, how, how could you fire the coach of the Islanders this year after everything they went through with COVID? They had half a team half the year. So, again, weird one. And again, I, I'm not saying there's something terrible we don't know about Barry Trotz or I have some sort of inside information about him and how he's a terrible coach or how people don't like him. But why? And I, I, think, I think it's fair to ask the question why. And maybe it's a red flag as to why I say we, the Toronto Maple Leafs, or maybe any team for that matter, should not run run at this guy, at least prior to like investigating the reasons for this. Yeah, no, you, you bring up an interesting point because I was just as shocked as anybody that he didn't stay with the Washington Capitals. And I know, you know, there were reports at the time, I believe that it was like a financial situation yeah. where like he wanted to be like, I don't know, the highest paid coach in the NHL and they w- wouldn't be able to do that for him. But I don't know, it was just kind of a weird situation. Like he gets Ovechkin his first cup, does a phenomenal job with that team. You know, we know his track record with Nashville. Then he goes to the Islanders. He turns that team around completely. Like they were one of the worst defensive teams in the league and immediately become like the best defensive team in the league with Barry Trotz. There was a crazy stat. I'd love love to look it up. From the year before he got there to the year after his first year, they went from like worst goal differential in the league to like plus, I don't know, like it didn't even, it was like a swing of like 150 goals or something. Maybe not that much, but it was a crazy swing in goals. Yeah, he he's just an incredible coach. And who knows, maybe with coaches like that, their messages just, they just, they just wear on you year yeah. after year. Maybe it's just, it's just so like the way that he coaches and it's just, you know, the tight defensive structure, like everyone has to play their roles. Like we're not a run and gun team over here. Maybe it wears guys out. Mm. I don't know. I like, I'm not in the room. Like I've never been coached by Barry Trotz, obviously, but who knows? Maybe his style just wears, wears players out, wears out organizations just, and, and who knows? And it's, it, it could be great for certain organizations who want to get back on track who haven't had success in a long time, but I don't know for other teams, maybe they just need a new voice in there and they feel like his message just gets stale. And maybe that's why we've seen him now, you know, go through three different teams in the span of how many years has it been. Right. So who knows, maybe there are some red flags there, but it'll be interesting to track where Barry Trotz ends up in the very near future as he takes Mm -hmm. a year off from hockey, but Lepore, before we end off this podcast, NHL awards. Oh God. All right. Do we have to? <laughs> they're, 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 they're just bizarre. Okay. So let's, let's set the stage here. So the NHL has like, I want to call it like maybe 10 major awards, like eight to 10 major awards. Half of them, Lapore, were announced on Twitter like three weeks ago. I know. I okay. Know. So we knew like who won the Lady Bing, who won the Jack Adams, uh, who won the Selkie. And sorry to cut you off. Sorry to cut, did it not make you feel weird? Because it's almost like they're saying these are the less important yeah. awards. As it's, just, it's just bizarre. It's weird. So they, they announced like half of the awards on Twitter, like three weeks before. And then they save like the big five awards for the awards ceremony. And they, they handed them out the day of game five of the Stanley Cup. Or sorry, the day before game five of the Stanley Cup final in Tampa mm-hmm. Bay. So what are your thoughts on the NHL awards? Because it's just... I don't know, man. I, I feel like it's just it's just not that great. Oh man, it's like they put this thing together with like scotch tape and like eighty seven dollars to to pull it off. My take on the, the NHL awards, or maybe just award shows altogether, is that they have to be either a plus, a hundred miles an hour, great entertainment, big money, big investment, or don't have it at all. Don't have an award show at all. Just announce the awards announce it that's it and someone a good friend of mine made a point he's like how great would this be if they did something i don't know like what the perfect timing would be if it'd be like before the last game of the season or maybe i don't know if you want to do it in the playoffs but how cool would it be if say okay austin matthews wins the heart and he gets it on the ice or even maybe first game next season the first it gets announced First game next season, Wayne fucking Gretzky walks out with the heart trophy and takes and hands it to uh, to Austin Matthews. How cool would that be? Oh, that would be amazing. Or you get like Patrick Wall to walk out with the Vezina or whatever. Like that'd be fantastic entertainment. The way they do it, it's horrible. They get these same guys to host it all the time. These bad jokes. 
And then even you, you tell me, man, I almost feel too. these people, they get to hand out the awards. They're not even hockey fans. They're always like mispronouncing names and they're awkward and how they talk about the awards. It's just brutal. And the NHL is just so bad. Like people say it's like a gift of like, you can just make things look good. The NHL just doesn't get it. Like, I, I don't understand. And it's definitely the smallest of the four majors, but I mean, these franchises are still worth, you know, 700, 800, 900, a billion dollars. Like we're not talking like this is like the national lacrosse league or like some indoor soccer league. It's still the national hockey league guys are making uh, 10, 11, $12 million a season. Very, very weird. I, I just don't know how they don't have an ability to like, just get things right and make things look good. And I'm not saying it's gotta be like crazy entertainment, like a crazy band or whatever, but have a theme, have something that works. I think maybe they were onto something with the whole Vegas thing when they were doing it in Vegas, but I guess this year with the all-star game being there and they didn't want to, and they just wanted to wrap it up before the final Long season. Yeah. But I just, I don't know, man, it, it's, it's, it's cringe. It's cringe. And again, it looks, and even like the venue, the venue looked like, like some sort of hall in a hotel. It wasn't even like well put together, just terrible, man. Like I, I thought it was really poorly done. And then if you want ideas, NHL, hire Bruno and I, and we'll whip up someone. We'd love to do it because I, I think they need a lot of help. They really do. Hire a consulting firm. Go to the NBA. Hire the GFP podcast. Exactly. On the NHL awards. The GFP NHL, <laughs> NHL awards. And then like, what does this say about it? That Connor McDavid didn't even show up. Best player in the there? league is just like, screw this. I'm not even going. Yeah. Sh- go ahead. No, I'm going to say, sure, he probably you know, felt that Austin Matthews was going to win the Hart Trophy and it didn't really matter. But it's like, if you really want this award ceremony to matter, isn't it important that the best player on the planet actually shows up to the ceremony when he's nominated for multiple awards? Yeah, no, it's it's, it's horrible. They imagine which Wayne Gretzky not being at the NHL awards. It's a total fucking joke, but... Like, it's just, no. it's just so bizarre. So I agree with you, man. There's there's some issues with the NHL awards. Like, it just, it just doesn't hit the mark mm. at all. No. You know, going back to the fact that, like, they kind of just don't care about half the awards. Like, how could they not announce the coach of the year at the S- NHL awards? Like, is seriously. That, that's a big enough award, is it not? You'd think. To have, like, Daryl Sutter and... I already forgot who else was nominated. I know Sutter won the award, Mm -hmm. but like to have all the coaches in there in the room, like that would be pretty cool. That's another one. Get Scotty Bowman to walk out with the, uh, the Jack Adams and pass it. Just like, that's sick. Just, it just, I don't know. They they miss it, man. I'd like to know both. I think about this with the draft too. I'd like to talk to me, people in the NHL or people in media, how much ratings have dropped. And with that, how much investment and attention has dropped since the idea of smartphones because back in the day and even to to that matter trade deadline day remember the whole thing people would like take the day off work and sit by the tv now you get you get the alert on your phone in two seconds and you don't have to watch it i mean the nhl awards you don't have to watch it you get an alert that says austin matthews wins heart trophy done like 100 percent. like no one's running to go see his speech (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. With so all the I'm, information at our fingertips and how you said you could even watch Austin Matthews speech on Twitter, like five minutes after he gives exactly, it out because exactly. someone's going to tweet it out, whether it's, you know, someone just taking the video, like an independent person, or whether it's the NHL or the Leafs tweeting it out, like you're going to get that information immediately. Mm-hmm. So you're not necessarily running to the television to watch Austin Matthews give his, and also, I mean, Austin Matthews, Austin Matthews doesn't give good speeches anyway. Like, does any hockey player, Bruno? It's the oh, NHL. Honestly, man. no one gave a good speech. Yeah, they ask I these guys remember. these questions. Like, even they kind of put them on the spot about, like, not necessarily comparing him to McDavid, but just like, you know, like how you guys like push each other. Like, what's he supposed to say? Other than like, McDavid's amazing. And he's a brilliant player. Yeah. And I love having him in the league. Like, what's he going to say? Yeah. You know he's not going to be like, well, I'm a 10 times better goal scorer. Than yeah, exactly. McDavid. There's he's a reason I won ass. this award. I mean, it would be amazing entertainment. But in, in the NFL, maybe something like that would have been said. But no, you're not yeah, going to no say that in the, answer, in the but, NHL. No. All right, Matt. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest before we wrap up this podcast? No, as much as I love to uh, repeatedly punch the NHL awards in the face if it was a person, I, I think I think we're done here with the criticism of the NHL. Horrible. I, I love Horrible. it, man. It's disappointing, man. You're a big hockey fan, NHL awards, you sit down and you're just like, 
what <laughs> you're just, you're just confused by how, how bad and awkward it is and just just brutal just brutal you ruined my day bruno talking about the nhl awards oh god i, I love fired up michael lapore about yeah. something like the nhl awards doesn't happen too often <laughs> only michael lapore can get this pissed off about the nhl awards i love yeah. it yeah but no they're, the nhl man there's so many things they just don't do right i mean fix the officiating fix the nhl awards we can do an entire podcast on on officiating we won't get into that today but man there's just so many things that the nhl just doesn't do right and if you literally just talk to people that knew how to you know do certain whether it's officiating the nhl awards i I can go down the list with the nhl just like talk like you said talk to like a consulting firm that knows what the hell they're doing talk to fans who know what the hell they're they're doing and the nhl thousand fans talk to them ask them questions what they want to see what they don't want to see uh, horrible. Yeah, there, there's so many things that they can just just do better. But mm. that is going to do it, everybody, for episode 66 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast, hosted by Michael Lepore and Anthony Bruno, the Colorado Avalanche, our Stanley Cup champions. What a year it was. Once again, I mean, we said this at the end of the Leafs season when they lost in the first round, but thank you again for listening and supporting this podcast throughout the season. I promise you, we are not going anywhere. We are going to be here throughout the off season for the draft and free agency. Any news that breaks with the Toronto Maple Leafs, we will be here to cover it all. But once again, thank you guys so much. And as I always say, if you enjoyed the show, give us a five-star rating and review on Apple and Spotify. And if you're watching us on YouTube, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell. So you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. So for Michael Lepore, I'm Anthony Bruno, and we will see you guys in the next one. Thanks so much, everyone.